right? Okay, now, okay, there was some a bit of a problem. This YouTube was not streaming, but okay, here we go. We are we are live on YouTube. Okay, uh, you ha you have three photos here with us right now that we are going to showcase to everyone, and uh, I wanted to bring up the first one, and it's a. Uh, it means something to me because this particular shark is it's a mako shark and that's what my my uh my son is named after so can you give us a bit of background on what this uh project was all about um so yeah every three years canada the world gets together at the CITES, which is the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species, to okay. decide which animals get uh, more or less protection in the international trade. And oh. for last year, the Makos were proposed to be listed on an appendix two, which means that basically you have to prove that the Mako shark is caught in a sustainable way to be able to export it to other countries that participate in CITES, which is almost anyone. Um, so I came up with the idea to do a story on Mako sharks, which is one of the most heavily fished sharks in, in the high seas, and work together with all the shark NGOs to try to push to make sure that this listing would happen for Mako sharks. So that's a bit of the backdrop behind the reason why I started focusing on, on this particular shark. How was the, how did the campaign go though? Uh, was it listed? It was listed. Yeah. Yeah. Arguably one of the, the most surprising listings, like we didn't think it was going to happen. Even when CITES was going on in Geneva, we were all there and it, it wasn't looking too good, but uh, it definitely, yeah, it did get listed. So that was, that was a, a good win for us all. Nice. Nice. Okay. And for Mako sharks, yeah. I'm sure. And uh, that's something to tell my son. <laughs> so yeah. uh, when was this project? When did you shoot this project? Um, the planning of it started uh, yeah, in 2018 already. I had the idea. And then, you know, just trying to find a, a good story that might connect with, with people and especially connect with the delegates and the, the people who are actually voting and making decisions at CITES. Because that's what the, the film and all the, the media we created was more catered to. Mm -hmm. It was used in workshops all over the world uh, where all these country delegations come and, and meet. And yeah, we can show them what's going on in the field, show them the status of the shark, how endangered it is, and, and you know why it's important to protect it. Okay. So kind of trying to convince them in all these closed workshop so th this right. film was not just made to to be online and you know seen by a lot of people it was really with a, a targeted audience um uh -huh. and and yeah that that was kind of the idea we had in 2018 to do that and work together with like the wildlife conservation society pew charitable right. trust uh, like a whole bunch of different ngos uh picked up on it and, and used the material in their campaigns okay and then in 2019 was the actual uh filming yes. like earlier in the year yeah and then the vote at CITES also happened in 2019 and it was in August uh, last year okay so it was all well worth it uh we have let's bring up that photo and uh okay can you tell us about something about this photo yeah this one I, I kind of like because uh, typically you don't see them so serene in a way. I love the way that the light just kind of hit the front of the Mako shark. And it, to me, it kind of, when I, when I took the photo side later, it's like, oh, you know, it gives a, a little sense of hope. You know, it wasn't this aggressive looking shark because Mako's typically with their, you know, their, their tooth sticking out and they're kind of, right. I wouldn't call them aggressive, but they're definitely you know, they want to investigate what you are. They, yeah. they often come really close to you and they're you know, the fast shark in the ocean. So they're, they just come right at you sometimes and turn, turn right before your camera, which can make some, some really dramatic, cool shots. But this one, I thought it was quite the opposite, you know, right. and it didn't look aggressive. It looked kind of beautiful in its element and, and the light was hitting it just right. So to me, it was like, yeah, this is, would be a good picture to kind of, plea for more protection for, for Mako sharks.
That's true because it looks uh it looks very usually the the, the, the Mako looks very menacing in the way that you know uh, yeah. and it rarely closes its mouth. I, I don't believe it closes its mouth, right? Because, um, and the teeth it is always does, there. Yeah. yeah, often, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, you can always see them when they get close. And then they are the fastest uh, sharks in the sea. Yep. Okay. And then is this uh, this is you taking a photo of the shark? Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of it's a basically you know lives in open water. Uh, it's a pelagic species, so it's often caught in the in the high seas in fisheries. And if you want to go see mako sharks, you know you got to go out in the deep blue. Right. And yeah, that's what it looks like. You, you don't really see them over. A, for anything not like reef sharks and yeah okay. and here yeah so with this photo here and that's that's how you often see them because you have to use some kind of charm or bait to attract them okay. when you're out in the in the blue they're right. not just gonna show up you know if you jump in the water so like like most shark diving there is some bait used to get them there but it's created this huge tourism industry Okay. So that was one of the, the elements in the campaigns, like these sharks are worth so much more alive than dead. Like you have a global industry that is worth upwards of 300 million US dollars a year okay. just for shark tourism. So I thought, you know, the previous photo kind of showed that with a lot of tourists wanting to see these sharks, because not many uh, of the delegates at CITES believe like, oh, who, who's, who really wants to jump in the water and pay to see these sharks? Right. But there's actually quite a lot of people. Yeah. So when you took this photo, you had bait, you had food in the water. Did you chum it? Uh, when you see the, yeah, yes, the people on the boat did. So mm -hmm. they have a, a slick going in the back of the boat. And then on the okay. bottom left of the photo, you see this kind of, yeah, they're, they're uh, flashers, they call them. Okay. They're, you know, look like kind of really bright, shiny fish. And the Mako kind of goes to that and gets interested and, investigates it and then this is what you often see too they just come <laughs> right up to your camera and we never use the bait like and pull it away so the the shark bites in front of you like right. i never really was interested in that so you know don't have any pictures like that but here yeah that was um on a day without any tourists we had our own boat with just me and uh, people i was working with in in baja in mexico for this yeah. and yeah this shark just circled around me the whole time and kept this kept his eyes really close to the camera so yeah so you would chum it and then how long would it take for the for the mako to actually arrive sometimes they don't come uh, sometimes you know two three hours other days it's five minutes it's there's really no rule like it's the ocean and it's nature so yeah you that's never true. know that's true okay now uh as you know, it, it's, it looks very, very menacing. And um, no matter how menacing that shark looks, photo, this next one is quite sobering. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. So Where was this? In Baja as well? In Baja as well, yeah. So I worked there with a, with a, a local NGO. Well, I mean, they're, they're global, but they're based in Mexico, uh, Nakawe. Okay. And they know a lot where the shark fishing is happening there they work a lot with the fishermen and they also kind of started working with an ex-shark fisherman um, turning him into a tourist guide which is a brilliant way of kind of curbing shark fishing on a local level okay and you know he was showing us around a bit and of course you know to bring a story like this out you also have to show the the ugly side right there's right. the shark finning going on and makers are used for their meat a lot too and this spot here, yeah, that was a, a small village, a typical artisanal uh, shark fishermen that were mm. working. And as you can see, the heads are not really that decayed. So this was most likely all from one day of fishing. Okay. Not maybe the previous day, maybe that day we, we came across it. But yeah, there's all these heads of mako sharks and, and silky sharks laying on the bottom. And that's just from one small boat. Okay, so at this in when you go to Baja, there you have you have the Mako shark tourism, but at the same time you have these artisanal fishermen who are fishing for the same species. Yeah, 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 and actually it's one of the most common meats used in uh, fish tacos. It's not advertised, but 
we did quite a bit, well, the Nakawe, the NGO that's working there, did quite a bit of testing on the, the meat in tacos and found that in some places up to 80% was from Nako sharks. Wow. So it's it's consumed locally, yeah, big time, actually. What and is people the, don't even realize. What is the conservation status of the Mako shark right now? Um, it's pretty dire, in especially in the Mediterranean. The Globally, it's thought there is a 60 to 96% decline in the wow. Mako shark population. Okay. So that's pretty dire. Um, they're listed as endangered, according to IUCN, and even one population there in the Atlantic is listed as critically endangered. Right. And yeah, at CITES, they're on Appendix 2 right now. So meaning um, the trade internationally can only be done if it's proven to be sustainable, which is very difficult to prove, really. It's very difficult to, That's true. to fish yes. mako sustainable. And how long does it take for makos to reach uh, sexual maturity? Um, I think like most big sharks, it's uh, probably around 15 to 20 years. Yeah, and okay. then they don't pup very often either. And how many pups per gestation? With Mako, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's around 15 to 20. Okay. So it can't catch up with from... the way, the, the, the volume of which they're, they're, they're fished out. No, I mean, even some scientists would say if you stop fishing them in that area in the Mediterranean, that it, it will be, won't be until 2035 that they can kind of grow in numbers again. They'll still be declining because even in the fisheries in Mexico, what we saw a lot was that they're all juveniles. Nobody's okay. catching the big ones. Like right. they're almost gone, which is, yeah, really dramatic because, you know, even if you look at the numbers and if maybe they're not that bad in one area, if there's not really many uh, females producing pups, then, yeah, you're going to have a big decline in the years to come. Well, I'm sure. And then you have an interesting, uh, you have an interesting shot here. This is a, yeah. Is this the dried head of a mako? Yeah, sold as souvenirs. So that's the thing with with makos. They're kind of menacing look. Uh, people seem to like there for yeah. souvenirs for some reason. So yeah. you know, not only do they fall victim to shark fin trade they fall victim to menacing meat that they produce because the meat is considered uh, a lot nicer to eat than most sharks okay it's a it's a red meat it's yeah supposedly a, a good eating meat as they say but okay. then they're also used for souvenirs like this like you can find the heads at these souvenir stalls you can you can find the jaws alone as well sold as souvenirs and just the way their teeth are shaped and that is, is quite a popular thing for people to buy there so you know they're, they're used in many many different ways wow and how much does this go for a head like that it, it depends a lot on the size but yeah upwards of 500 dollars, i believe to when i asked at this shop wow yeah wow okay and how many were were there available at any given time quite a lot i would say the day that i worked walk through the market there you could probably if you would go in every stall there'd be at least like a hundred heads at least and that's just in this one area the jaws yeah way more way more of the jaws wow okay. and then these are also the jaw yeah these are the jaws yeah 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 these that could mostly be probably all mako actually these ones yeah and these are what juvenile yeah. you would say some of them would be yeah and some of the some of them a bit bigger, all mixed up, and and again the price varies a lot on on the size of them. Right. The bigger, the more expensive they get because yeah, obviously they're bigger, but also they're quite rare. As I said, you know they catch mainly juveniles. Like of all the the shark landings I saw while there, which was quite a few, they were all juvenile, juveniles. Every yeah. single mako. Yeah. And when talking to the fishermen, that's they they also were like, yeah, you know, we used to catch the big ones, but not anymore. We only catch these small ones, and yeah. Okay. It's an indicator that something is is pretty wrong. Like, yeah, here you can see one of the fishermen. Just how small. Uh, and I admit there, yeah, how small that mako is. Yeah. Yeah. How old do you think that mako is? This one, a few months maybe, if that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, really, really young. young. Okay. Yeah. And then you have also. These are the fins. 
Yeah, so that was at the same uh, fishing beach there. Yeah, a whole bunch of different fish, uh, shark fins ranging from uh, some mako, hammerhead sharks, some blue shark fins. Mm -hmm. And they all get weighed and then sold. Yeah. It doesn't and matter what species, they just mix them all up. Pretty much. Uh, surprisingly, though, from the small sharks, I saw them throwing the fins back in the water. So they're that little that they didn't hold much value. So they actually were not keeping all the, the fins. So it was the meat that was more interesting for the fishermen on some of the mako sharks they were catching. Okay. Which, you know, it's kind of surprising to hear. You'd always think it's only the fins. But in this area, that wasn't the case. Like the meat is really, I wouldn't say it's an expensive meat there, but, you know, valuable enough for them to, to keep fishing uh, makos as well. Okay. So... You've shown the last uh, five photos that you've shown were more of what has it, it's more destructive in nature. It was that uh, the ugly side of the you know of marine conservation, and then but prior to that, you had all these beauty shots of the makos. Do you think that okay, as a photographer, do you think that the the destructive side, the bad side, also has an effect in terms of positive change amongst? The general population or does this really just work in terms of society's campaigns or ngos and so on no i think it i think it works for anyone if you can tell the story behind it like a lot of people were very surprised when i mentioned the fact that that meat was used in fish tacos like every tourist that i talked to there they had no idea and they were eating fish tacos after going shark diving you know they just had no idea yeah. that it's one of the more prominent meats in there so i think if you can if you can capture images and tell that story, um, you can reach a lot of people. But of course, in campaigns, they, the hard hitting photos, they do work as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just part of the whole story that, that you have to tell. Right, right. Okay. And then next, you actually showed us, you, you set the photos of the, is this from CITES? Yes, this is uh, at CITES in Geneva um, last year. Yep. Okay. So I think that's actually the photo there just uh, flipped on on the big yeah the big banner and mm -hmm. that was yeah right into the before going into the plenary hall where where all the the votes happen and and so. Okay. And then you have these mascots. It's the same like here in, yeah. with with Anna. Well, these are I think Anna made sure that okay. these mascots made it there. I think they're all made in the Philippines. Really? From, uh, okay. What I remember, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it could actually be that Anna is in one of the costumes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I remember now we met through Anna Oposa. He, Anna is the chief mermaid of Save Philippine Seas. Yeah, I remember that yeah. now. Yeah, okay, okay. And then uh, this last photo is from the conference itself. Yeah, so how, how we, you know, work using this media, it's, you know, obviously if you take the pictures and then do nothing with it, it's not going to create any kind of impact. So okay. as I mentioned earlier, the, the main goal was to use the video and the images in the workshops leading up to CITES. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that everybody that has a vote gets to see it, gets to hear the story, and hopefully it will influence them, you know, in, in a positive way. Right. And then at CITES, the whole thing is like you just go around all day talking to uh, different country delegations, seeing if you can, you know, gather a sense of what they're going to vote and if there's any way to change their mind. And together with the other NGOs, we made like these shark side events. It goes from a shark happy hour where we stand around like and you have the mascots and you give pictures and st statistics on the Mako, share stories. And, and then you also have like this private uh, film showing where right. all the different countries are, the delegations are invited to come and watch it. And then we talk about the story we did afterwards. Okay. Okay. Now, um, we had, we have a few guests who are on Facebook. We have Roxy Agbayani and then, uh, you have quite a lot of reactions from their photos. Um, we also have my friend Mabel who goes diving with us. Uh, she went to Socorro actually. Who's, I, I was supposed to go to Socorro in uh, January of next year, but because of the COVID-19, it was postponed. But we were also planning to go diving with, uh, with the Mako Sharks in a side trip. And then Sally, Sally Snow is here. Ale Ponzo is here uh, as well. Hey, Ale, Sally. 
<laughs> so Ali and Sally were are from the Mave. So uh, it's uh, interesting that you actually worked here in the Philippines for how long? Was it 10 years? Yeah, I think I, I lived there on and off for, yeah, about nine or 10 years. Okay, yeah. okay. And then what were you working on while you were you were here? Must have been a lot of work. Uh, well, I came, first I came, uh, yeah, basically to, to surf <laughs> in, uh, in Shergao, like, yeah, how long ago now, like almost 20 years ago. So before it was even uh, really known. So that, that was w- one of my first motivations back then to come over. And, and I worked as a dive instructor for a little while and then uh, turned into like an underwater photo instructor before I started working on more uh, conservation related projects. But, right. but yeah, I followed uh, Ale from uh, La Mave around quite a bit. Yeah, we did some filming there and, and yeah, documenting a lot of the projects and yeah, did some filming with Bajau and Philippine Crocodile and yeah, lots of different projects. Okay. So before we leave the Mako Shark segment or the, the series of photos, I, I remember from your TED Talk, you mentioned just for, just for the benefit of uh, our viewers who aren't familiar with marine conservation, uh, you were saying that it was a CITES convention. And in, the, in your TED Talk, you, li- you likened CITES to like the Noah's Ark. Yeah. Yeah, because it's it's basically where people decide which animals gain more protection or not, you know, like okay. who's left behind and, and who can come along and, and maybe survive. That's what it feels like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from Chum. Uh, he is asking, how is your Tagalog, Steve? Oh, uh, it's pretty bad because I lived in the Visayas the whole time. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> so you're more Visaya. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I... Uh, I, I wouldn't say that either. It should be a lot better, but definitely more Visaya. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have Mona Polo, who is saying hi. Do you know her? Oh, yeah. From uh, Blood Red. Uh, oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. From yeah. yeah. That's what uh, Lamav is wearing all the time when we go yes, in the indeed, shark expeditions, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so today we have another set of photos. And uh, before that... Uh, again, I would like to say hi to everyone who is joining us or who has been here. I do apologize that it wasn't apparently broadcasting on YouTube for a good five or th- five minutes. So the whole intro was just totally scrapped. It was just on Facebook. So for those joining us, Behind the Shot is a show that features top visual storytellers and their three favorite photos and the stories behind them. So in as much as we are a talk show, we try to focus more on the work. And I do this mainly because I want to help amplify the work of fellow photographers, especially those who are working in conservation. And today we have Steve Deneef, who is a conservation photographer. He's a filmmaker. He's also a director. If you want to see more of his work, head on over to his Instagram, Steve Deneef, and his Vimeo, Steve Deneef. Steve Deneef and I guarantee you guys are going to you're gonna get blown away. You can also visit my Instagram, Noel Guevara Photo, to get an idea of the work that I do as well and how I actually met Steve. So we met, uh, we were just basically talking about sharks. It, we met in uh, Marine Wildlife Watch of the Philippines office, if I'm not mistaken. Anna was there. And then we had a few drinks that night. And then you came back to the Philippines, I think, a year later. And I took your, your portrait photo. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah, haven't been indeed. back since then. No, I probably need another portrait soon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my wife, Pam, is online and she's saying that my son, Mako, is watching the Makos. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Hopefully the nice photos, not the scary ones. Okay, so let's move on to, to the next set of photos. And um, this one is a bit different because this is work that you have done in the philippines yeah yeah right yeah okay. and uh yeah indeed and if uh, ali and sally are still watching sally was with me on this trip here to the kaluya islands okay in the uh, philippines yeah and this is a uh, bessie um a local seaweed farmer and yeah it's i i do love covering stories that involve people that rely on the ocean mm-hmm uh, as their livelihoods and and yeah i heard about this place through another friend uh, shannon arnold the researcher who was living in the philippines back then too i think she might still be there um 
and it just sounded like an incredible place to go and and visit and what really prompted this trip was that after typhoon Haiyan or, or, or Yolanda, I heard that, you know, they had lost almost all the seaweed, all their lines, mm-hmm. but seaweed's a crop that grows so fast, they were actually able to recover fairly quick if they could find some seaweed seedlings and the, and the materials and, you know, that they would be fine on their own, they could recover and, and start their livelihood again. So. We started fundraising a bit to buy some materials mm-hmm. uh, to go for the for the seaweed farmers, and then yeah, a little bit after the typhoon, we we went over with the materials and did a story for um, Asian Geographic. That was my my main thing to to go there and share that story with them mm-hmm. and continue the fundraising for for this community. Right. And Sally also was there. We did some filming and it ended up on a, a BBC three, something called Fresh Online. Nice, did a yes. short documentary on that. And yeah, it was just an incredible place to see and incredible people to meet. Like Bessie and her family, for example, her husband, Victor, and they lived in Manila for a while. He was using working construction and they just weren't really getting by very well at all. And then they went back to the islands where they could make a lot better money for them like it's actually a fairly profitable um, job for for her and her family and you know they just have more family time because they're out on the boat together with the kids uh going collecting the harvest or putting out the lines and it was just this great lifestyle and pretty good livelihood that is not not because a lot of the fishermen now there are um, seaweed farmers, so okay. it has le- you know less stress on the on the local fish populations, and yeah, it's just all over the way it was done there seemed to be sustainable. You know, um, Steve, uh, what kind of camera were you using for for this shot? Here, that was a, a Canon 5D Mark III with a 1635 millimeter lens. Okay. At- the 16 millimeter end for, for the split shot. Mm-hmm. And I did have, I'm pretty sure I had two strobes here. Uh, one that was lighting up the, the seaweed on the water a bit. And one that I kind of put above the water right. to get a little bit of light on the seaweed farmer's face. On yeah. the farmers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then how were the, how were the produce used? Were they consumed like in the way that seaweed normally is when it's dried? Here it was mainly used uh, dried. So Mm -hmm. everything was collected then dried and then it was uh, mostly shipped to Cebu City and processed into carrageenan. So do they they earn more from this? Sorry. Yes. Do they earn more from this one? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They often describe their their seaweed lines as their bank accounts, you know. Uh, And the the big difference being like one line can turn into 10 lines in in the matter of a a few months, you know, three, four months. So they could just take the cut the seedlings off one line, put it on another. It would grow and grow. So it it was a really and hopefully it's still really a sustainable way of, of making a living. Okay. And then you were saying that uh, they were quite fortunate that they were using seaweed, they were farming seaweed, because even if and when Haiyan hit, uh, the seaweed really grew that much faster otherwise yeah. and uh, with the right conditions and with very minimal equipment. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Because at that time, I was living in the Philippines uh, when, all, when Haiyan hit and all that happened. So I was traveling around a lot afterwards, working with different NGOs and documenting the aftermath and trying to raise funds and, and so on. I noticed in a lot of different islands that mainly relied on fishing, like they had lost all their boats, but not only that, it was the reefs were destroyed and the fish was nowhere to be seen. So even if the bigger NGOs came in and donated boats, mm-hmm. that didn't mean the fish was going to come back right Correct. away. Yeah. You know, like I even went on the water in some of these places and, you know, it was dire and talked to the fishermen and they were, even though they had a new boat, they weren't catching anything this place it was hit really hard too you know a lot of the houses were destroyed and and definitely had a a big impact but their livelihood was recovering fairly quickly without much help from outside okay okay uh the so are you saying the whole community there in kaluya so kaluya is i believe off the coast of antique in the province of antique 
Yes. Right? Yeah. In Visayas. And so the whole community there actually relied on, transitioned already to seaweed farming. Yeah, the, it was the main source of income there. Yeah, in the whole island group. Okay. And then what other projects did you work on while you were here? I believe, aside from Lamave, I remember you also had a project with the Bajau and you also worked with Malapascua. Yeah, yeah, I did a few uh, film projects, a few documentaries that involved the Bajau. Um, mm-hmm. Did a story on the Philippine crocodile, which is uh, the mo- one of the most endangered crocodiles in the world. Okay. Um, very, very hard to find. It's a freshwater crocodile, though, so, well, can leave in salt a little bit too. But um, And then, yeah, Malapascua, um, just like the Mako shark, um, we did a story on treasure sharks for CITES, which was now, I guess, seven years ago when that conference happened. And, um, you know, similar to the story we found on the, on the Mako, we used Malapascua as kind of like the footprint to show how valuable treasure sharks can be for an mm, economy. For tourism. And, right. yeah, and even actually with the same uh, typhoon with, with Haiyan, it was the same thing in Malapascua where the livelihood wasn't necessarily gone. You know, yes. when the tourists came back, the sharks were there and people could rebuild their homes and, and earn money again. Yeah, that so, is a good thing. Yeah, that was one of the stories we did too well there. Okay. Uh, we are now just finished the second epi- second uh, photo from, from Steve. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, um, so Sally's still here. And uh, please do like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to get more uh you get notifications on future episodes of Behind the Shots. And again, I'd like to invite you to check out Steve's Instagram, uh, Steve Deneef, and his Vimeo, Steve Deneef as well. So it's you know very, not that hard to remember. We have this last photo with us right now. And um, I have to say that we are going back to, to sharks again. move on to this photo i'd like to invite everyone now to on facebook to try to move on to youtube so we can continue i'll be cutting that stream so we can continue this discussion this is a great set of photos from steve and you wouldn't uh you wouldn't want to miss it so yeah so steve let's uh, move on to our last set of photos so yeah, where, 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 where did you take this photo that was in um, Mafia Island, in Tanzania. Okay. Uh, for a story we did for for National Geographic, a uh, video and some in a photo series. Okay. And it's the only kind of known place in the world where whale sharks don't really tend to migrate. They seem to be resident, um, as far as as I've heard from the scientists working there. Okay. Um, so. I joined the Simon Pierce from the Marine Megafauna Foundation. They do oh, a lot okay. of whale shark yeah, research. Yeah. yeah. So they had a project there. And, you know, when he told me about it, it's like, wow, I got to go and, and check that out. So luckily, we, we were able to do the story for National Geographic. And when we were there, we saw some yeah, amazing scenes. Like, I never thought I'd, I'd saw anything like this on the water, which here, the, the top layer, it's a kind of algae called trichodesmium. Okay. And it tends to form when there's not a lot of wave action, the water's kind of warm, and but it gave these really weird kind of red and purple colors on the water, and it also blocked the light. Okay. So these sharks were feeding on shrimp, and the shrimp were congregating against this layer of algae and, and kind of open blue water, and they're kind of swimming in and out of it. So I had the idea, like, if I dive down kind of, halfway under this trichodesmia and if a shark comes up kind of seeing it come up into the light would be a really cool effect right and uh yeah it happened it happened there and and i think uh the the next photo that you showed was a photo from from simon pierce that he took of me and you kind of see the the chaos a little bit of all these sharks feeding around this uh trichodesmia on those little surgested shrimp okay and yeah, you, you couldn't see them come out of that layer of, of algae. So I was diving down to photograph one there. And before I knew it, this other shark was coming through this layer and oh, going nice. right above my head. And yeah. Wow, it looks so, like so much fun. How many sharks were there at any given time? Um, hard to tell individually. Uh, but yeah, at times we definitely had more than 10 sharks just wow. all close together. Yeah. And this is all year round. Is that what you're saying? Or. 
so the they have a season like I think it's November till about February or October till about February where they come in close to shore. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the sharks there have been tagged, like I think as early as 2003, I think okay. they started, or 2006, something like that. And from the, the tagging, they know that, well, these sharks haven't left. So what happens in the off season when, when you know, it's kind of rough close to the island and that the sharks tend to move just slightly offshore. Okay. And Simon Pierce and the scientists that are working there believe that they don't really leave because there's plenty of food around all year long. So okay. typically whale sharks tend to migrate to, right. to where the food is. Right. And I guess there they didn't really need to go anywhere. And it was a population of mainly juvenile males. Right. So I don't know what, what the current data from there is, if, if they're still all around there. But, you know, back in uh, 2016 and, you know, back then, yeah, the same sharks were still around. They had been there for like 10 years or more. Yeah. Okay. So is there an established, like, let's say, a tourism industry for these sharks here? There is. It's uh, it's not. It wasn't very big when I was there. So you know, not many tourists. Not compared to to a place like you know Don Solo or Slop in the Philippines. Like mm -hmm. it was not at all at that scale. But there definitely was a a good tourism industry going. Okay. And what was interesting too about this place, which was one of the reasons I wanted to go and and check it out, was that the fishermen for years and years had used whale sharks to find fish. So these whale sharks are feeding on these shrimp and oftentimes you get like a mackerel or even tuna or uh, different schools of fish also feeding on the same shrimp. So the fishermen had figured out like, well, if we follow the whale shark, we're going to find the fish that we right. want to catch. So yeah. they were never really interested in catching whale sharks, but they were using them as kind of a tool okay. uh, to find fish. So yeah, here, here you can see that layer of uh, trichodesmia here in, in, in a whale shark coming through from above. So okay. It was quite spectacular. So there was a coexistence going on with the fishermen and the whale sharks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I remember the story. I, I'm not sure if it was in Indonesia wherein the, the fishermen were actually getting uh, bothered by the whale sharks because they were ripping the nets. Yeah. Sucking the shrimp yeah. or something. So in this case, it was not like that. No, I mean, even though sometimes the whale sharks, they, they do get caught in the fisherman's net and they clearly don't want to lose their fishing gear. Right. So it's not something that, that is good for either fishermen or a whale shark. Okay. But yeah, typically they they kind of like them because, you know, they guide them to where the fish is. Okay, okay. Now, uh, what what kind of camera system we're using for this set of shots now? Um, well, here, obviously, there's a, a, a drone. Uh, I think back then it was a phantom tree. Right. Yeah, phantom tree. And all these photos were uh, taken in my, my brief switch to mirrorless. Uh, <laughs> Sony A7R2. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how was your stint with mirrorless? Um, yeah, it was a love-hate <laughs> relationship. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I'm sure people would like to know what were the challenges that you faced when you were shooting with mirrorless? Well, th this was my first or no, my second trip with the mirrorless system. And I think the biggest challenge back then, and, and we're talking about the, the Sony a7R II, mm -hmm. it was uh, the battery life was, was pretty bad at that okay. time. And also the, the files are huge. They're like 42 megapixel images, you know, just huge files. And they're writing to an SD card. Even the, the, the fastest SD card I could buy, like if you're shooting um, high frame rates, like with these whale sharks, because right. all these photos are natural light. You know, the my camera kept freezing up. It just couldn't couldn't write the files. Okay. And oftentimes I had to go to the boat, open up my housing, take out the battery to reset the Sony to be able to take pictures again, which, you know, when an event like this was happening, that's not what you want to be doing. You want to okay. be So I, I think at that point, like the, the huge files and that they were just ahead of what the, that camera could actually handle um, when you're really, you know, putting it through tests, like when you're using it high frame rates and yeah. But I remember during this event, I had to go to the boat and release the vacuum of the housing, take the camera out, reset the battery. I had to do it twice on this day, which 
yeah, that's not really what you want out of a camera. That's true. Okay, so now what, what camera system do you use? Um, at the moment for, for filming, I mainly use a, a Canon C200, okay. so one of the cinema cameras. And for uh, stills or like uh, the, the Mako project, for example, I just brought one camera because we had to, we could take a lot of stuff and traveling a lot. Uh, I use a Canon 1DX Mark II, which okay. does pretty good video and yeah, great stills as well. And that is a good backup to your C200 as well, if you need to. Camera. It is, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And this one is your last photo. It is a, an aerial of, a, of four sharks. Yeah, that was in, uh, again, Mafia Island. Yeah. And there are four juvenile male sharks. And yeah, there were way more in the area at that time, but it kind of shows how, how close together they are there, um, going around, trying to feed. And yeah, just an incredible place. Yeah. And, and there is um, no established uh, fishing village as well there that are fishing for the sharks. It's all, they're all basically left alone. Yeah, the whale sharks are definitely left alone there. Yeah, right. there's no real history of, of whale shark fishing. So again, it's kind of a nice story to show how a fisherman that can live in harmony with these sharks, you know, and, and use them to their benefit, whether it's, you know, their, their friends and that going into the tourism industry or some fishermen move into tourism. So it, it creates less pressure on the local fish stocks. And, you know, then they also use the whale sharks to find their fish. So it was really all plus plus there. Everything was positive. Yeah. 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 Uh, so before we, we end this session, uh, I'm sure there are a lot who are asking. Um, I had an email, actually. I received an email from, from this college graduate in the UK. And she was asking me if he wanted to be a conservation photographer slash filmmaker, what would be the best route to take? And then uh, I remember telling him that there are many routes there are many ways that you can go through it and for example you can go through the uh the formal learning type of way go to film school if you choose to do that or you can volunteer how was it for you steve did you get formal training in film in fo photography and how did you get into conservation photography uh no i know i didn't i didn't go go to college or anything like that no mm -hmm. i just started traveling at quite a young age and uh, I think, you know, if, if you, especially if you want to get into underwater photography, being a really good diver is very important. Right. You don't want to go out into these fragile ecosystems if, if your diving skills aren't up, up to par yet. So I think having that background and a background in marine biology might serve you better than a background in photography okay. in this field. Um, but yeah, then, you know, work, finding, I think finding projects and finding stories that inspire you trying to find the, the right scientists or NGOs to work with that kind of align with your views on conservation is a really good way to get started mm -hmm. and just follow your passion a bit. And I mean, if you can win the lottery along the way, that's a really <laughs> good way to get started too, but <laughs> cause it isn't the, the easiest field uh, to make a living out of, but, right, right. but yeah, I think teaming up with people that have different skills than you and, and different knowledge like like scientists and other conservationists, um, different NGOs, that's a really good way to go about it. That's true. And if you partner up with an NGO, you also get to have, what I was telling him was that it's not financially rewarding to volunteer, but I think it's the best way because you build up yeah. a portfolio very, very fast. Right. Yeah. And um, and that was his, that's what's important. The faster that you could build your portfolio, the better it is, uh, the more that you can present to whoever who, who may want to hire you or who you want to apply to. Is that how it went for you? Yeah, it, it kind of did. Like I never really started out with, oh, I'm going to do this story and, and, and sell it here or there. Or, you know, it just was like, oh, this is a really cool story. We got to we got to share it. We got to tell it. And. I don't know, I felt like whenever you do that, you follow your passion. And if it's a really good story, you work with good people, somehow it always kind of happens. Like somebody will pick up on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's how it, it's happened for me oftentimes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that is the end of our show, Steve. It was a great honor to have you on board. Thank you for saying yes to this. I know you well, didn't want to. Me. I didn't know. I know you didn't want to wake up so early in the morning because I know it is around seven a.m. there, so it's twelve hour difference. 
Yeah, it's right? a bit early. Uh, I think the, the kids will, the kids will be awake soon here. <laughs> yeah, so Steve actually has triplets, right? Yeah, three little boys. Yeah. <laughs> How old? Are three for three. They're three year old. Two year old snow, yeah. right? yeah indeed. oh wow that's amazing yeah. so how is it how are you how are you able to balance your work you know when you fly off and do all these conservation work and then you have and then the kids are at home well my my wife is a rock star so you know she's pretty good with them and we got uh help from from family and yeah yeah, friends here and there so that's good a good support system. yeah it takes a it takes the village <laughs> that's true that's what i've always been saying steve thank you very much for joining us uh please do not leave our our conference i will get back to you in a bit i will just close the show so uh you want to say goodbye to everyone who is watching sally ram is here actually bo Mankow is here all right well thanks everyone for watching and uh yeah i hope it was interesting we should get you back on with all your other photos. It's hard to choose. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, right? Okay, Steve, thank you very much for joining Behind the Shot. I will all see right, you in thanks, Noel. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. All right, and that was our fourth episode for Behind the Shot. And again, we had a bit of technical difficulties at the start with YouTube, but we were able to get back on. Behind the Shot is brought to you by Deity Microphones. And thank you guys for joining us. I would like to, again, just touch on what we have for this week. Aside from Steve, we also have Shin Arunrug Stishai from Thailand. He is a conservation photographer and he has been doing work on uh, dugongs and uh, on sharks as well. And this guy is a National Geographic Explorer. And then rounding it up for Friday, we have Boogs Rosales, who has also been working in conservation and has been filming commercially as well. And he has some really, really great photos and videos. So as I've been mentioning, when you're working on conservation, it's what we call, you know, you're wearing so many hats, right? And you get to be a photographer, a filmmaker. It just evolves that way. And uh it's great to have these guys. And of course, Shin has a lot of stories to tell, uh, especially for the dugong, because that was one of the most heart-touching stories I've seen from his end in Thailand. And I can't wait for him to actually tell us that uh, what happened with that one. I, I remember it was a bit tragic, so I will just let him tell the whole story from there. So on Wednesday, we are having Behind the Shot again, and we'll be back in our original time slot of 5 p.m. So... Everyone is watching on YouTube. Thank you very much for being with us here. Please like the video, uh, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Thank you very much for your support. We hit, I think, 820 subscribers this week after four months. And that is incredibly fast. So thank you very much. And I will see you guys on Wednesday.